the purpose of these meetings is to hopefully inform you and engage with you in a process that we're undertaking as, as NHS Dorset CCG to look at what we need to do about healthcare services to be high quality, safe and sustainable for the next 10 to 15 years, almost at least. And what I hope to show you is the process we're going through to reassure you that, that we are not making decisions. This is not at this point in the time a decision part of the process. But what we're trying to do is engage with as many people both within the healthcare service, within the, the general population, the public, and all the agencies and partners that we work with to ensure that actually when we come to the point of having to make a decision, we make the right decision. So if I can start the slides, and I'm sorry if these are rather uh, lengthy, I've already mentioned some of our key principles here is to ensure that the services that people receive that we are responsible for ensuring are delivered are the best quality they can be, are the safest they can be, and actually are sustainable. And I hope I can explain what I mean by the sustainability shortly. The whole process fundamentally has three, three phases. That's why we put four up on, on, on the slide. But the first two are the first, first phase. The first phase is what we're calling the design phase, is really coming up with strong arguments as to why we need to go through this process, why we can't just allow the current system and the way of working to continue, and then to suggest possible models for how we can change and what needs to change, but then take those models out to a formal consultation process, that's part two. And that will occur through the summer up until early autumn. And then once we've done that public consultation, had all the feedback that we can obtain about that, then that is a point we would need to make some decisions and then we need to implement what those decisions are. And that would follow after autumn of this year and probably will take several years to fully implement. So what have we done up to now? Um, what we've done up to now is try and gather as much information and evidence to actually support why we need to change. And we're calling it the case for change. And there are various versions of, of documents available, some very detailed that um, are heavy and difficult to understand, and I would say that myself as a, as a clinician, others which hopefully put things in much more understandable way. And all of these are available both on our website and available from us if, if, if you haven't seen them. Um, and I would encourage you to certainly at least see the more public facing document. Because what it is showing is that whilst Dorset as a whole has actually very good healthcare services compared to many other parts of the country, A, they could still be even better there's still a lot of variability, both in terms of what goes on in hospital settings, in the community settings, in general practice settings. But also, whilst in Dorset you haven't had in the press about how this healthcare system is financially broke, that is not going to be the case going forward. And there are some real concerns that actually in Dorset, we're going to have some major financial challenges going forward. And so when we put all of these, these things together, then certainly I believe, and many of us believe, is a very strong case for actually not doing nothing, but actually doing something positive to try and make things and, and improve things and make them su sustainable. So, what are we be doing about involvement at the moment? I've touched on this briefly. I mean, this is part of the involvement process at this stage. We're keen to make this whole process what we call clinically led. Um, that's not to deny that 
anybody else has equally valid involvement, but I can say it, I've been through many reorganisations in the NHS in the past, and I have to say they're usually either politically or managerially led. And this time, we want the clinicians to be equal players, but we also want you to be equal players as the public. You're going to be on the receiving end of these services, and we need to know they're ones that you feel comfortable with and you will appreciate and, and understand why things are changing. But we've also got to be aware, we're working with many other partners. I mean, healthcare delivery isn't just about doctors, it's not just about nurses, it's about local authorities, it's about voluntary agencies, it's about a whole range of other organisations and people that actually support, help, and are actively involved in people's care nowadays. And so we need to bring them into our, our, our discussions and get their views about how to go forward. So, you know, it's been, and it is an ongoing, very wide consultation process that we're doing. We have, as I've, I've referred to, we have completed some of our work. I say completed, I mean, when, when you're looking, say, what evidence is there out there to change, then it's a bit like a string with no end. We could keep on getting evidence, and at some stage, we've had to say, right, we've got enough evidence to say that actually we need to do something different. So that has been you know, not completed because ongoing evidence will always come in which will inform our further discussions. But you know, we've had to say, right, this is it, we've got enough evidence, there's enough justification to change. We've also, with the help of, of uh, external agencies, we've looked at actually what's going on elsewhere in the country, what's going on elsewhere in other healthcare systems abroad and internationally, because we, we, we need to learn from other people. You know, in Dorset, we're not, we're not right all the time, and we need to know if another area is doing things better, is doing things more with better quality, safer and more sustainable, then what can we learn from them? So there's been a big exercise in looking at national and international examples. There's also a lot nowadays of quality recommendations about standards that should be achieved. So we've also brought all of those in and, and measured ourselves against, are we achieving those standards? You know, are we, are we achieving the right level of, of, of consultants in A&E departments for the sort of work they respond to? Are we, are we looking at, at, at things appropriately like that? We've also begun to discuss and, and, and decide you know, some key themes. In all of this, you know, there are some things that, that aren't clinically related, but actually I need to be there to support best clinical practice. And I'll come back to those. So we've done those. And, and, and those, you know, we've called them enablers. And, and I've got a slide which we, you'll see later with, um, with what they are. The need to change, again, I've, I've touched on this really, but I think it's worth just, just emphasising some of these things so that you, you feel comfortable that at least we are th we're thinking about the right sort of things. We can't escape the fact that you know, we have changing demographics, we have an ageing population. One of the successes, perhaps, of public health more than actually NHS is people are living longer. They're not just living longer, they're living longer with illness and disease, all of which requires different sorts of health care. We, in our evidence collection, and I've got to be honest and say, I've been surprised personally when presented with the evidence how much variability there is across Dorset in every part of the healthcare system. And, and there are some examples of absolute highest quality practice, but unfortunately there are also examples of perhaps practice we could certainly be better. And, and one of the things we have to do through this process is 
try and remove that variability and bring everybody up to the highest. I've also mentioned, and I think it's worthwhile being explicit about this, that if we carried on doing what we are currently doing and paying for what we are currently paying and receiving the money from central government that we currently receive, by 2020 we will have almost certainly £200 million deficit and probably more than that. So, you know, the financial challenge to us is considerable. We have to assume that whatever political persuasion is at the top, they are not going to be able to fund that level of deficit for us and every other area in the country. So something, we have to look at the finances. We cannot disassociate ourselves on that. We've held... Three big meetings so far, fourth to come up, where we've invited a whole range of clinicians and others in Dorset, mostly clinicians but some other support staff. Um, we've had about 120, 150 clinicians in the room at these meetings and we've presented our case for change. We've then asked them, okay, if you accept that, what do you think good would look like? If we removed the variability, brought everybody up, if we achieved all the staffing standards and everything else, what would, it, what would good look like in Dorset? And we've done this under four themes. Um, the themes, I mean, the problem with choosing themes is you always exclude somebody or appear to exclude somebody. So. I'll mention them and then explain why we chose those. One of them is maternity and paediatrics. One of them is urgent and emergency care. One of them is planned and specialist care. And the fourth one is long-term condition and frail elderly. Now, I have heard many people say, but you've left out some very key disease areas there. Well, and, and, and I think the one that immediately springs to the mind is mental health. We made a positive decision to do that because we strongly believe that you cannot dissociate mental health from physical health. The two go hand in hand. And there are some people, yes, with specific mental health conditions, but those are being incorporated into our planned and specialist care and long-term condition. I mean, I have a particular angst. Long-term condition historically has had some very tight definitions of things like respiratory disease, diabetes, heart disease. One of my jobs until about a year ago was leading a group in the CCG on musculoskeletal conditions. Well, my argument was, Okay, so 10% of the population have diabetes, 50% have heart disease, X number have that, but I would say 100% of 80 year olds have joint problems and stiffness and musculoskeletal conditions. So, you know, I think some of the definitions need to be actually challenged and, and widened. So, you know, that, that's the principle. There's four groups and, and the clinicians have been divided into those four groups and, and been asked to review the evidence for the case of change and then begin to come out with potential alternative models. And I, I think I'd like to stress at this point, they are only suggestions. They are not decisions. You know, we are not at the decision-making stage here. As I say, the decision will come after the public consultation when people will be given the options to see for themselves and to balance up the various different potential models. There will be clearly some refining of those potential models and, and some of our discussions has, have looked at 60, 70 or more different options. But some of those can be very rapidly, we think, 
put aside because of applying certain evaluation criteria. But, but what will come out of that is not just one decision. It's, it's, it's not saying this is what we're going to do. It will be a question of these are our options. What do you think? Which way do you think we should be moving in the future? The core themes and, 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 and principles that, that we've, as clinicians, have, have been discussing really are put on this slide. And, and some of them are predictable but maybe need more, more explanation. Some of them have been talked about for an awful long time. I mean, being a clinician for 30 odd years, I've heard so many times care closer to home is the way forward. And I'm sorry, I've never seen it yet. Um, in fact, I've seen just the reverse, that more and more is done in big bricks and mortar buildings. And so what we are beginning to say through this is actually, no, this is the time to really make a difference. This is the time to really say, if you don't need to go to these big bricks and mortar buildings, yes, you might need to go because they do have a very vital role. They do have the expertise and the facilities that people need. But if you don't need them, why go there? Other principles, prevention, yes, a lot's talked about prevention, but you know, if we're going to manage the finances better, we have to prevent illness, or at least prevent the progression of illness much more than we've done in the past. We have got to work, as I indicated, nowadays in modern healthcare delivery, we can't be isolated, we've got to work together. We can't just have doctors in one room and nurses in another and social workers in another or in even different buildings. We've got to work much more as teams and, and use each other's skills and, and, and support each other through, through this. We have to accept Society nowadays in this country is not a nine to five society. You know, it, it is a 24 hour society, a seven day society. Now that might mean different things to different people, but you know, we have to accept that, you know, and the evidence is there for some, some situations and some conditions for the same condition and the same presentation if you contact the health service on a Sunday afternoon, you're going to have a worse outcome than if you contact it on a Monday afternoon. And that's not right. We've got to address that. There are mounting national quality standards about what we should be achieving, and actually about staffing standards. And, and we, have to, we have to deliver those. And one of the things that, that I have seen over my time is a tendency that to cope with the rising demand, the first person you see is probably the least qualified person that you need to see. And sometimes you need the more expertise and, and the more experienced person, and I'm saying perhaps I should come back into clinical practice, you know, that, that to see you first of all who makes that rapid decision. I mean, I, I remember a story that when we did a public consultation about physiotherapy services, a patient saying that she'd had six appointments with a physiotherapy about her shoulder and got nowhere. They then referred her to a physiotherapist who was an expertise in shoulders. She had one appointment and she got the condition resolved. You know, and, and that taught me a lesson that we need to organise ourselves to be much better at matching the expertise with the condition earlier in the process. These are the enablers, the key enablers. They're not necessarily clinical, um, but we do believe that if we're going to go through this process and create a more responsive healthcare system, these are the things we need in place to do it. I won't go through these ones. Um, I think I've touched on some of them. Um, I would just perhaps highlight the last one. I think we do have a role in understanding that actually a lot of people who have illness and disease actually don't like coming to the healthcare system. They want help to manage their condition better themselves. 
And I think we need to get much more involved and engaged in that. So, where are we? Um, as I say, we've done our case for change, but we had to draw a line because every time we looked at that, people questioned it and, and added new things and challenged it, but we got to a point where we felt there was more than enough evidence to say we do need to change. I've touched on developing uh, em emer on emerging models. Um, we've divided this into two parts. We've talked about in-hospital care and out-of-hospital care. The reason for that is that there is, you know, currently, the CCG has, a, give or take, about a billion pound for Dorset. A half of that is spent on three acute hospitals, the care delivered by three acute hospitals. The rest is on community services and a whole range of other things. But being half of it in acute hospitals, really we need to separate that out to start with from what happens out of hospital. But at some point, we have to bring those two together because they are so inter interdependent. So my next bit, I would just want to talk briefly about some of the themes about what out of hospital care might be looking like. Again, I want to stress this is no decision being made. There's really just a bit of blue sky thinking about possibilities. So I'm just going to talk about some of the outer hospital models and then I'm going to hand over to my colleague Phil Richardson who will talk about some of the thoughts around in hospital models. So let's do this first of all, out of acute hospital care. I'll have to turn around. This slide just basically shows what currently are our community hospitals. And um, I think it's fair to say that this bit is, a, is about you know, what is out of acute hospitals. So that is out of rural Bournemouth, Poole Hospital and Dorset County. So there are community hospitals currently. And this, this again is just a slide to to give you some of the thoughts that have been, been going around. And, and some of this is a, is a repeat of what I've said. Again, prevention comes up. And you know, I think it's important we include mental health here, and, and that's on the slide. Different potential models. Um, let's use the facilities we've got, rather than just say, let's scrub them all out. We have these community hospitals in the more rural parts, although we've got Wimborne and Wareham, which are around, and Christchurch, which are around the periphery of, of, of Poole Bournemouth conurbation. Let's use those. Um, understanding, however, that one of the things that Dorset is, it has the widest variety of demographics, probably than most areas. I mean, we, we often hear of examples coming out of London, Northwest London is one of the particularly quoted examples, but I can't say there's many green fields very much in Northwest London and certainly no rural villages. Um, there were probably 100, 150 years ago, but not now. But in Dorset, we have some very dense urban conurbations, some very challenging inner city deprived areas. And that's not just in Bournemouth and Poole, I mean, Wayne with Portland have some of the highest deprivation markers within Dorset. But against that, we have some wonderful rural scenery with scattered population, small populations. So the message is we're not, we're not saying that one size fits all. We're not saying this is one answer for the whole of Dorset. But we have, and have to have an answer for the whole of Dorset. But it may be different perceptions and different models. Integration of intermediate care services. This is more about going back to my, my point about team working. One of the problems I've seen over the years with the NHS is more and more times people are driven to work in silos. So you have your GP, you have your hospital doctor, and somewhere in the middle you have what you call an intermediate service. But really, actually, what we want is one service. 
you as patients and the public don't see that. You don't want to see that. You just want to know that actually when you contact the healthcare service, it is one healthcare service and you get the right people for your condition at the right time in the right place. But unfortunately, over the years, there has been this silo mentality and, and, and working within the NHS. And, and we need to break those barriers down because, I mean, 30 years ago when I came a, a GP, I would say, yes, I probably just had a district nurse and a health visitor supporting me I, and, and a hospital consultant. Nowadays, I, can, I could access physiotherapists, I could access different forms of nursing, specialist nursing, I could access you know, primary care nursing, I could access community nursing, I could ask, access hospital nurse specialists. So we need to make sure that they're much more integrated into one team. And that also is touched on by the alignment across providers. And, and, and this, this, there is a division about providers, the division between providers, the division between commission and provision. And, and really, at the end of the day, you don't need to see that. You just need to know that it is one service. The last bit is, is segmentation of patients is, is interesting. Um, I, I, I find that, personally, that terminology quite challenging, but there is no doubt that one of the challenges we really do have is that actually a few percentage of patients consume a high percentage of resources of the NHS. And whilst we're looking at, at not one model fits all, we have to say that somehow we're going to have to say that Actually, we need to identify those patients who need all those services and manage them on a very much individual patient, as a, on an individual case, as much as we do somebody who hardly ever comes to make contact with the NHS service. But when they do, they want just as responsive service. So we, we've got to structure ourselves and identify the people who are at highest risk and highest need but making sure those people at lowest risk, lowest need, when they do contact, are still responded to appropriately. This, this next few slides just give a few headlines around some of the things that are coming out of the clinical working groups. So I don't want to dwell on these specifically and go through. I'll stand back and let uh, people read them. Maternity and children's services are here. There's mounting national pressure about standards there. There's, there's various maternity reports and, and childbirth reports come out, and all of which we need to, to be aware of. This is just planned and specialist care to give you a flavour of some of the discussions we've been having in the clinical groups. Looking down at the bottom, use of community settings for low-risk surgical uh, interventions. Uh, again, that is something along this line, care close to home. Urgent and emergency care, this emphasizes a seven day a week service. In primary care, as well as at, you know, any other part of the service, again, you know, I don't wish to segment out. There's been some thoughts about what should, in, in, in certainly in general practice, in primary care, should we what we call in stream planned care? So if you've got diabetes and you need a regular checkup, then should that be almost separated out from the person who suddenly wakes up one morning with acute abdominal pain and needs to contact their care services? And we were at a meeting last night, some of us, and, and there was a lot of discussion around that and, and around, you know, do people feel that, that if you separate it out, do we lose continuity? I personally would, wouldn't mind hearing what, what your views would be about that. Just, this slide just gives you some of the other discussions about perhaps the organisational structures. Historically, GP practices have been very independent organisations. Uh, again, my experience in the early days was there was almost open competition between GP practices. Now, there's much more collaboration between GP practices. 
sometimes to the extent of sharing back office functions, but also to sharing clinical skills and knowledge. You know, if, if you've got a GP who's got an interest in diabetes, can he help in the care of patients from his neighbouring practice? And so we, we, we're having some thoughts about how actually can practices, GP practices, work much more collaboratively with better patient, you know, using expertise, using resources. And this just tries to illustrate some of the models. The, the blue-purple blob in, on the first two really uh, just designate a notion of what's called a community hub where a lot of the services for, you know, so if you've got a GP with, with expertise in diabetes, um, he would go to the community hub and he would see patients from more than his practice but elsewhere. The middle one is about still having practices around that, so for a lot of situations you'd still go to your own GP practice, but if you need something a bit over and above that, a bit extra, you might go to the community hub, you might go there for your physiotherapy, you may even go there for, for some outpatient appointments, you may even go there for some basic sort of investigations. And then the third is, you know, the practices still remain independent, but they do work in a much more cohesive way. Now these are only suggestions, we're not saying that this is how it's going to look, and we're not saying these three are the only ways that, that we, we might look at structuring GP practices. But it just gives you a flavour of the sort of discussions we're having. And I think this is my last slide, which was quite interesting. In one of the working groups, um, people were asked, OK, blank sheet of paper, not saying where people are currently seen, but where could they be seen for their need, their care needs? And um, it was quite interesting. This was a mix of GPs, hospital consultants, nurses, a range of clinicians. And it was quite interesting because from the blank sheet of paper, um, ah, there, our patients, they were saying 70 to 75% of our patients could actually be done in a community setting. Of those that currently go to one of our three acute hospitals. That actually, if you need an intervention, but you don't need to be put to sleep or sedated, it is something local, that 80% of that can again be done in the community setting. And that actually, if, say, you've had a hip replacement, a knee replacement, or an injury, and you need physiotherapy or whatever, rehabilitation following that, up to 90% of that can be done in the community setting. And these were just some of the thoughts that were coming out of the clinical group. I think that's the end of my bit. Thank you for listening. I hope I haven't bored you. I'll hand over to Phil now who will take you through the uh, potential acute hospitals. Okay. Uh, morning, everybody. I'm Phil Richardson. Um, I work in the CCG, and I'm the director responsible for this review. And what I'm going to do is uh, share with you the thinking around what happens in hospital, which connects to the uh, session that Chris has just presented, which is around what could happen in the community. So if we, if we focus on uh, looking at the hospital piece, uh, it gives us an opportunity to say what, should, what needs to happen in a hospital setting as opposed to what currently happens in a hospital setting. Um, and you've seen from Chris some of the th thinking that could happen in the community, which means that we can look at hospitals in a different way. It's the same for uh, clinical groups. So sticking with um, the first one is frail and elderly, what, one of the big challenges is the communication or the connection between being in hospital and being out of hospital. So, so a key theme is about how we get much better connectivity between those two. I think that also plays into um, the piece about treating the person as a whole, 
Would anybody in this room have a problem with being treated like a person? No? General agreement there, then. And, and I think one of the challenges we currently have in the hospital setting is you tend to end up in a speciality and you tend to be treated for that speciality. And I'm sure some of you have got experience of having to go back multiple times for multiple things and come back to the GP for multiple things. So our opportunity is to connect these things together and say, actually, if we look at the whole person, what actually could be done in the hospital while they're in hospital and what could be done much better in the community? So I, think, so I think that's important and plays back to that first point about connectivity. And then I think it's about making sure that the in-hospital care is as good as the out-hospital care. So we've got some examples today where if you need A&E and you need a consultant, in the three hospitals that we have, there isn't consultant available in the A&E for 24 hours of the day. They're available <clears throat> and they can be called in, <clears throat> excuse me, but they can't, but they're not available all the time. So that's an improvement, that's an opportunity that we can improve that service. So we could provide in the A&E consultants available full time. And that will improve the quality of care for patients. If we start looking at it in terms of the um, maternity and children's services, we have, a, we have a similar opportunity here too. If, if you are a mum and you get into trouble, in our current hospitals where we provide maternity services, the obstetrician isn't available 24-7, 24, 24 hours of the day, seven days a week. They're only actually on the ward in some hospitals in working hours. Now, I, I'm sure uh, if, if, we, if I could cast your mind back to when you were a baby, can we do that? <clears throat> no? I, I'm sure if we did an hours of the day you were born, I, I'm sure there will be a big proportion of the room that wasn't born between 9 o'clock in the morning and 5 o'clock in the afternoon. <clears throat> uh, so there are some difficult people in the audience who were born outside those hours, right? So, we, so that's a real opportunity for us to improve that service across Dorset, to provide for, we, for when difficulties happen, to have, a, to have the consultant available in the hospital at the time. It also gives us opportunities to start to look at uh, midwife units. So Bournemouth, for example, has a midwife-led unit. And the thinking from the College of Midwifery is that is a really good way of helping mums in the community. So we've got an opportunity to think about how we improve that service. So looking at um, uh, uh, children, so looking at the paediatric service, we have the same challenge. We do not have paediatricians available 24 hours a day in the paediatric wards. They're available, but if you were a mum with a child in trouble, wouldn't you want the consultant to be available there, there and then, to get the service? So that's a real opportunity we have. So now balancing to what Chris has talked about, about out of hospital, if we can start to, to ad adapt and embrace that, it gives us a real opportunity in hospital to improve the quality of services. So there are some challenges around stroke care. So Dorset at the moment doesn't achieve the quality of care it could when we compare to other counties in the country. So other counties provide a better stroke care service. So that's a real opportunity for us to start to think, actually, what should be the service here? We wouldn't want to be sitting here with thinking, actually, below average is okay, would we? We wouldn't want that. But by focusing specifically on how we address all of the hospitals and what this clinical services review is, gives us that opportunity. So in other parts of the country, which get into difficulty because they've run out of money or get into difficulty because they've got quality issues, they focus typically in on a service or a hospital. Here we can look at all our hospitals, 100 GP practices, 650 GPs, all of the community services and think, for the people of Dorset, of which there are approximately 750,000, what's the right thing to do? Now, of course we have budgetary constraints, of course we do, and we have increasing pressure on getting the quality right, but that's, that's got to be a good thing. So for maternity and paediatrics, the thinking said, why don't we have 24-7 obstetric consultant cover? Why don't we have 24-7 paediatric cover? If we then have a look at um, the planned and specialist, so this is, the, this is where you have an appointment for a planned operation of some sort. 
There are good examples in the country of much better ways of doing that, where you pull all the specialities together, all the specialists together in one place, and you can be much more efficient and much more effective, and you can have the theatres running all the time. So at the moment in our hospitals, the theatres don't run all the time. So we've got very expensive equipment running, and we're not using it. Well, that doesn't make sense, and that might play into some of the thing we have about expense. There's also an opportunity for thinking about um, simpler procedures being done in a much more effective way, also collectively. So, so why don't we think about doing that? So that's it. That's a clear piece from the, uh, the planning specialist. And then I think looking at uh, urgent and emergency, I'm sure you've seen all the news and some of you may have experienced some of the challenges uh, over this winter period about A&E. We need to get better at A&E. We don't have enough consultants on in the A&E centres, so we need to do something about that. <clears throat> We have difference of services depending where in the county you go to for A&E, so we need to do something about that. But we've also got challenges around um, supporting across the community. So at the moment, most hospitals tend to work independently. We could create something which is called a network, which is where they start to work together as teams across hospitals. So that gives us a real opportunity to uh, improve our, uh, our service. But we do have challenges in Dorset. They're, uh, recruitment is really difficult. There aren't enough people in the system, we struggle right across the patch, and we do get to situations where some hospitals are competing for the same person. <clears throat> so that doesn't really make sense either, does it? So we need to think about how we can network the workforce much, much better. And what the CSR does is gives us an opportunity to do that, because it, unlike in other areas where one hospital at a time has been looked at, we are looking at the whole of Dorset all in one go and we have everybody in the discussion. So Chris talked about the clinicians getting together. In a couple of weeks' time, there'll be 150 of them in a room, and that these, are, these are consultants from the hospital, nursing directors from the hospital. Uh, around 50 of the people in the room will be GPs from across Dorset. So this is a big group getting together. That's not been done before. Uh, as Chris said, we've got mental health embedded in all, all of our working groups. So we have psychiatrists and psychologists and GPs specialising in mental health. We've got, we're thinking about, from an acute point of view, what's the acute way of dealing with mental health. Um, and running in parallel to this, we started, before the Clinical Services Review, a specific review on mental health, and that lands about September. So we're expecting the results from that in September. And that ties in with the CCG decision around what we do overall with mental health in Dorset. We're, we're also working, we've also got the patient group, which Francis is going to come on to at the moment, and we've got uh, people with mental health uh, experience and expertise in that group. So we're, we're really embedding. I, I think we, we made a real conscious decision not to have mental health as being off to the side or separate or treated differently. We wanted it absolutely embedded. Uh, and, and in the acute part, it's, it, it's, a, it's a key part, which is how do we deal with mental health in that sense? Uh, the piece we didn't uh, talk about earlier, uh, just in, term, in terms of the population, in Dorset it's going to increase by 6%, which is bigger than the England average. So we're going to need more, squeeze more people into this room next time we do it. But actually in the over 70s it's going to grow at 30%. So the over 70 population is going to increase uh, five times faster than the, our actually average population growth. So we are going to have a big challenge. And then in the young population, which are currently the under 20s, that's growing. So we're going to have an imbalanced uh, community, which is a very big group in the over 70s and a very big group in the under 20s. And the workforce that we need to access to deliver the services is shrinking. So we've got some, we have some challenges in, in that space too. Sticking with that, coming back to the hospital bit, um, I'm sure uh, many of you can, pro can probably see their logic. Uh, if, if we have a certain service in somewhere, so we, if we have an A&E department dealing with very complex trauma, we need to also have next to it the surgery that's able to deal with that trauma. If we have the surgery, they ask for some very complex diagnostic routines to be run, we need to have that next to the surgery. So if you make a decision to have one thing, there's a, there's a consequence that you need to surround it with some of the other services. So part of our thinking around uh, A&Es is how do, we <coughs> how do we improve that combined service 
and bring the, bring the other services that sit around it. So if we have 24-hour A&E consultant cover, then they need to have the appropriate surgery cover next to it. So there's no point in having a consultant say, well, we need to get somebody into surgery if we just don't have that service next to it. So we need to think about how all of those things connect together. So there's a link to all the different complexities uh, that, that you have. If you, once you start thinking about, well, how, to, how, do we, how should we do A&E? What, what, that, what that gives us, this slide, it, you only need to focus on the three colours, really. Um, what I've put up here is just the clinical content, which shows in an A&E what you need to have. So you need to, if you have 24-7 uh, A&E consultants, then the consequence is you need to build uh, what we would call level three care, which is the ability to deal with the really complicated, very difficult trauma. So in the county at the moment, if there is a major incident um, that we can't deal with, we fly people to Southampton. So that's, that's the typical response. Um, we have uh, in the county at the moment, the ability to do A&E to a certain level a national guidance, so what we're being told centrally says, actually there is, a, there is something in between what happens in Southampton and what currently happens in Dorset that Dorset should, should think about having. And that's about improved coverage. So that's what the clinical groups have said, this is what we should do for Dorset. Um, and the, and the, colour, the colour coding effectively says, uh, if we focus in the middle, we're currently in Dorset all yellow. We need to add in green, so that would be an enhanced service for A&E. And then across on the right-hand side, purple starts to say, how can we think about moving some of the A&E activity out into the community? So that gives us an opportunity to, to make it easier for everybody to not have to go all the way to A&E down to, uh, well, you would go to Dorchester, would you, from here? Or Dorchester or Poole, I guess. It's... Salisbury. Or oh, Salisbury, right, okay. Oh, Yeovil, right, okay. <clears throat> right. <laughs> so every, you go from everywhere from here. Is this the centre? This must be the centre, isn't it? In terms of travelling to all the local hospitals. Well, the reason why mental health services are in there is because they're not defined under the A&E specifically. They're, um, we, we, we captured on there to make sure that it was, it, it's not lost. But, but the way, the, way it's de the descriptors... For, for essentially for the hospital types, don't say mental health specifically, but we are keep it, we have it included. But what it means from an A and E point of view, if you if you have a, if we go back to the um, the, the slide that uh, Chris presented with uh, a high number of diagnostics, so say if you go for a blood if you go for bloods or blood tests or if you go for an X ray in a hospital, 75 percent of people don't need to go to a hospital for that. If you look at A and E submissions. There's a very high proportion of people who could be treated closer to home if the service was nearer. So, so that allows you to become much more specialised in the complexity of things you can treat in some of the bigger hospitals. So this sort of thinking gives us the three different colours. And where the group is at the moment is thinking we need to be doing green, which we currently don't do. So that would be a massive change for how, in, in terms of the quality of services delivered within Dorset. So what happens is, if you take those three colours and say, we need to do green in Dorset, so we're, we're all thinking that's, the, that's what we need to do, and we need to make sure we keep the yellow service, and we need, to make, we need to start thinking about how we add in the purple service, that gives us three hospitals times that number of colours tried in a number of different ways, gives us over 60 different options. There are a number such as well, actually, what we'll decide to do is have only purple, so there would be no 24-7 A&E. Those options don't make sense, because that's worse than we've got now. So you can dismiss some of those options. So what we've got is, is, a, um, is, is a process to say, from that long list, how do we get down to a list which would, be use, which would be the right sort of thing to do in Dorset? So it starts out with that really long list of 60-plus um, up here. Um, we just then asked some questions, which is, does that make sense? Would people travel? Uh, is that giving us the quality of service, which allows us to come down to a medium list, which is uh, what we've got uh, now. And we've asked the clinical working groups to work through that and say, to achieve the quality, there's, that, there's the bit about finance and can we afford it. There's a bit about can we build it. So one of the options was to build a brand new hospital. But that would take a long time to do. So that would mean in the five years from now that we're trying to give good quality care, we wouldn't be giving the care we could give if we'd chosen another option. 
So that says that option is much lower down our list of what we think would be the right thing to do. So we end up with, uh, working through the clinical groups, we end up coming down with a short list of about seven. So we've currently got about seven options and there are 28 ways of making those options work. <coughs> And our next group that Chris talked about earlier, which is later in this month, will be, well, how do we get that into what would be the right thing to do for those three hospitals for Dorset? And then what we'll do is come to you and say, we think we've got these options. If we choose this option, it will mean this. If we choose this option, it will mean this. If we choose this option, it will mean this. And, and, and I don't know how many options there will be because we haven't got that far yet. And that will be, well, what's your view? Give us your view on where we've got to with this. But at that point, we will, we, will have, we will have worked through the numbers to make sure we can afford it and we can, keep, we can keep affording it, to make sure it addresses the services we talked about, to make sure it picks up the clinical work that uh, Chris talked about and, and I've touched on. And it will be, so any of these will work, what's your view? So that's what we'll be doing uh, in the summer. Um, we're using a really comprehensive list to, to decide. Uh, so this is available on our site. So you, you won't be able to read that, but I just wanted to show you the complexity. What I'm sharing with you now is what the clinicians see, so I didn't want to water down and give you a cheap version of it. I wanted to give you the full version. Um, and on, and we, the broad categories are, does, does this option for those three hospitals, does it give the quality we want? It needs to give the quality. Does it give us the access to care that we need? So access in terms of can we get to it and is it open? Um, does it give us the uh, affordability and can we keep affording it, so can we keep paying for it? Does it give us the, uh, the workforce, so we have, a, as I said, an issue about workforce and then we've got two others. One is uh, just practical deliverability. So you can come up with a really great idea that will never work and I think, uh, I think uh, the, the British way of thinking is brilliant for this because we always start out with that will never work, so we can test that early on to say, will this work? And then I think, that we, and then the final bit is, there are some other things about how do we do education? Can we get enough workforce educated? Can we get an, enough nurses trained? Can we get the consultants working? Can we get the medical schools lined up? So we've got a pipeline of people coming through. All of those things fit into our model. And that, uh, these criteria, and that will help us uh, narrow down. And that's what, that's what I'm asking the clinical groups to do uh, later this month. Uh, this is a summary of questions, which I think I've pretty much talked to. This was us trying to be creative. Didn't, didn't work, did it? <laughs> no? Right, good. So this is just about all the pictures of hospitals. Um, this is the seven I've just talked you through, so this narrows down to the seven. So, uh, and these are about services in the hospital, so green services delivered somewhere, yellow services and purple services, uh, and, that, and we need to work how that might work across Dorset. Uh, one of the key things is green appears in everything, so that's really important. And the other thing that's, uh, that's important is there, um, we, there's been a clear, clear, so clear thinking about how we deal with the east and the west. And then for some of the hospitals that you deal with here, we're working with both Yeovil and Salisbury to say, how do we make that work? Uh, so if you need to go, if you go north from here, how, how will that work? So I focus specifically on Dorset today the Dorset Hospitals, but we're also working with those two, well, and with Southampton, which is for that really uh, major trauma type of work. Um, so next, I'm going to finish with next steps, and then I appreciate we've been talking, I think Chris talked for a really long time, didn't he? <laughs> really long time, yeah. And that's him cut down from what he normally does, so, that, so that's an improvement. Um, I'm going to hand over to Francis at the moment, because I think there's a key bit about... Um, What's happening in engagement? So how can you get involved? How are we working? How do we capture all of your input? And then I think we've got a break. We've got a sort of comfort break, and then we'll get back together for your questions and for discussion. So if, I, if you could just bear with us for a few more minutes, which I, I'll hand over to you, Francis, if that's all right, um, to talk about engagement. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, I just wanted to start by saying thank you all so, so much for coming out this morning and giving us your time. We're really grateful for that, so thank you. Um, my name is Frances Avis, and I have the privilege of being one of the engagement leads for NHS Dorset CCG. And I'm delighted to be able to give you a brief overview of the engagement work that we're doing so far. 
Now, I think it's important to start with just exploring what engagement means, because I think it means different things to different people. Engagement's actually made up of lots of different elements, and they're all really, really important. So it includes things like view seeking. Importantly, it includes listening. It also includes hearing, responding, providing feedback. It also very importantly includes informing and communicating, having a two-way dialogue and consultation. So lots of different things. And they're all really important elements of, of engagement or what's commonly called participation nowadays. All really important and all really important across this review process. So if we look at the review process, you heard earlier from Chris about the key three stages of the review. Importantly, there was a stage that preceded that, that first stage, and that was prior to October of last year. We've actually been listening to you and talking to you and hearing your views for many, many years, both within the primary care trusts, within the various health networks that used to exist, the hospital trusts, Health Watch, SWAST, etc. We've been gathering views for a long, long time, and we've got a database of a huge number of reports. So we, at the start of this process, we gathered all of that information together from our stakeholder organisations, from ourselves, from Health Watch, and so forth, and put them into a database um, so that those could be shared with the clinicians. Also, um, during 2013-14, we did a significant um, health services survey across Dorset called The Big Ask. Did any of you hear about that or take part? Yeah, I can see several nods. That's great. Brilliant. Um, we got 6,000 responses from local people, which was a good representation across our, our demography and our diversity. Um, from that data, what was important in October was we recognised there were 29,000 qualitative pieces of feedback that we wanted to theme to find out what was important to local people in terms of their needs and their experiences and expectations. And I feel quite confident that if I gave you a blank piece of paper now, you would come up with the same kind of issues that have all fed into the need for change. So it was things like improved access in terms of time, improved access in terms of location, um, care closer to home where possible, happy to travel for specialist care where needed, better information, better continuity, better communication, and so on. All things which are really, really important, and as I say, have all fed into the very start of this process. Really importantly, across the whole process is information and communication. What we're really trying to do at this stage is to reach out to as many people as possible across Dorset, so that you know what we're doing and why we're doing it so that when it comes to the summer, we can actually have a meaningful and effective consultation with you, which will be extensive, and which I want your help with, which I'll come on to in a minute. I just also want to share with you a few of the things that we've been doing so far, and an update for February. We've been holding, as Phil said earlier, public events across December, January, and February, with the information changing as the review progresses. Yeah, but very importantly, we've been filming one of those three events in December, January and February. We're very aware that public events are important and, like I say, delighted to have you here today. But not everyone can be here. The working well can't be here. Um, the younger generation are in school and so forth. A lot of people don't want to come to public meetings. A lot of people feel that they're not accessible for them, even though we've held them in different locations and at different times of day deliberately. So what we're doing is filming these and then putting an unedited version onto our website, sharing that through the Council's Voluntary Service, Dorset Race Equality Council, um, all of our provider trusts, Dorset Community Action, um, and so on and so forth, also through Twitter and Facebook, as widely as we possibly can, so that people have the opportunity, if they can't be here today, to see um, the work that we've been doing, the conversations that we've been having. In very importantly, even though this is principally at this stage about informing and having a dialogue, as we're talking, we're collecting additional insight, which is vitally important. Totally understandably, people come to events and they have their personal situations they want to share about um, whether it be a rural or urban issue, a clinician, a clinical um, issue, a condition-specific issue. And what we're doing, just to reassure you, is we're capturing all of that information as we go. We're feeding that into a database and we're theming that database. 
which basically means that at the appropriate stage of um, consultation and implementation, we can revisit all of the information that you're giving us. We can filter it to find out everything that was said about mental health, everything that's been said about voluntary sector, prevention and so forth. So we can use all of that information that you're giving us, as well as all the previous information and the information that will come from the consultation. So it's a big database and it's growing every day. Please keep talking and we'll keep adding your views to it and considering them. And of course, very importantly, then letting you know how they've been used. We've also got a fantastic patient carer and public engagement group. It's a group of 25 individuals within Dorset Really importantly, it isn't about putting people in boxes, but we wanted to make sure that it was a representative group of our geography, our demography, and importantly, our diversity. And what we have is um, a group of 25 people who have a wealth of life experience across all of that. We're not expecting one person to represent mental health. We're not expecting one person to represent maternity. But each of those individuals represent lots of different things. <laughs> what we didn't want was 25 people from the same housing estate in the same area of Dorset. We wanted to have as diverse as possible as conversations so that they could critique and comment and feed directly into our process across the process. One example, um, we have um, a lady who's here today who has a special interest in adults with learning disabilities. She has her own long-term conditions, as do her parents, as do her children. She's a young lady who lives in rural Dorset. So she brings all of that richness, and that's mirrored across all 25 members. Really excited that it's chaired by um, a patient leader, a national patient leader, Anya de Jong. Um, she's passionate about the voice of patients, carers and the public, and is absolutely holding us to account to make sure that we listen, to make sure that we hear, and to make sure that we respond. If you Google her name, you'll see that she nationally blogs, presents, tweets, et cetera, et cetera. And she's fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Um, she's young herself, she has long-term conditions, um, and she brings a, a fantastic um, input into that group. That, that group have actually done some significant pieces of work across the review. The first thing they did in December was they said, this clinical data is very interesting, but we desperately need a public-facing narrative, which has now been produced, is also an easy read, and is also in audio, and available in other languages on request. Um, they also input into the evaluation criteria that Phil showed you that clearly the slide's complex, we can send that to you for you to review, but 13 of their comments that should things that should be added have all been included and they're all really important things to the people of Dorset and then more recently they've helped us to design some consultation objectives which I'm going to come on to in a minute um, I recently presented to the Dorset Equality and Diversity Forum. Um, we've also got a colleague who's reaching out to the diverse organisations and groups, offering them all visits from us and asking them all how they want to be consulted with us in the summer. I spoke to the Learning Disabilities Health Action Group last week. We did an easy read presentation with them and again explored how they'd like to be consulted in the summer. And we're going to hold some workshops with them in both sides of the county with people with learning disabilities, with their um, advocates and with their carers and family members. Young people, we're doing some fabulous work. They are just wonderful. We had a forum last night um, and they are helping us to co-design a poster which says what we're doing and why, which can go out into schools, youth clubs, colleges, drop-in centres and so forth. And then in the summer, they're going to work with us and what they would like to happen is to have a young people's conference, which they run and they present at and they facilitate at, which is going to be brilliant. So we'll just help them organise that and there'll be peers talking to peers, which would be fun, great. There'll be lots of social media and things as well, which is obviously the way that they like to communicate. The working well, really important and an ongoing challenge. I mentioned the films. We're trying to reach out through giving people opportunity to view what we're saying. We're also getting a list of our key employers within Dorset so we can liaise directly with them. And we're also working very care closely with our own NHS staff who obviously are a big, a big sector of the employment population within Dorset. Um, we're also presenting to Dorset's Connecting Advice and Dorset group next week to 60 organisations who all work with providing advice to people of Dorset. So that's a flavour of this type of work that we're doing. There's lots more and I'd be delighted to carry on but I'm conscious that it's time for a comfort break. Just quickly then, in the summer we really want to make sure that we have a really good and a really meaningful consultation with you and we want your help with that. The patient group 
patient care public group, as I said, have pulled together some things that they think are important. If we do a good and meaningful consultation, what will we have achieved when it's finished? They want us to have talked to a representative section of our population. They want it to have been accessible in a variety of methods, ways, formats. They want people who have taken part to have felt that it was worthwhile. They also want people who chose not to take part to be aware that they could have done and for us to measure that. They want it to be long enough for people to have an opportunity to be involved, whether they're on holiday or not, whether they're in school or not, etc. <laughs> they want us to make sure that it's long enough so that we can get within the timing of people and organisations meeting cycles and for us to remind people how long they've got to go. They want us to work together with you, with other local people, and also obviously with our partner organisations to do this work. They want us to show that the money we spend on it is worthwhile in terms of our reach and our response. That we provide effective feedback to you all so that you know how the consultation has informed the decision making. And also finally they felt that if we do what we want to do in a good and meaningful way, we should be held up locally and nationally as an example of good practice. So not much to do then. <laughs> Um, with regards to how you'd like to have your say, we have been, each public meeting this week and at all the different forums I've been going to, we've been asking people to feed back how they'd like to have their say. And what we've got is we've got a very simple survey to give out to you in a minute, which would be really grateful if you could complete. You can either complete it today and leave it here, you can take it away and send it back to a free post address, or there's a survey monkey link on the back page and you can do it online. So various different options. And basically there's a list of suggestions of ways that we can reach out to you. And then there's boxes to say, yes, definitely do that. Maybe do that, it's quite nice. And no, definitely don't bother. And then there's another box with your, for your local suggestions. So if you say yes, definitely reach out through local newspapers. Tell us what your local newspapers are. We hope we've got them on our list, but we might not have. So if you could give us your local knowledge, that will help us to get to you and work with you. and be really helpful. Importantly, at the end, there's a box for your suggestions as well. So it's not, com it's not um, a complete list by any means. So it'd be really grateful if you could help us with that. Um, and then throughout the summer, we will implement it. So thank you very much for listening.